Psalm 34 is where we're going to be. Go ahead and find that. And although usually we sort of read through the whole passage that we're going to go through first and then come back, I think today what we'll do is uh, just sort of take it as it comes. So Psalm 34 is where we are going to be. And there is a man named A.B. Simpson uh, with whom I would disagree about a lot of things, theologically speaking, uh, but he wrote something that I happen to agree with here, and I want to share this quote with you from A.B. Simpson. He once wrote, Out of the presses of pain comes the soul's best wine. Out of the presses of pain comes the soul's best wine. That's certainly not something that you'll hear from the hucksters of the health and wealth gospel today. In fact, it's not something that you'll hear in most evangelical churches in America today because it doesn't fit very well with sort of the popular picture of Christianity uh, that's kind of like one of those Thomas Kincaid paintings. You know, just sort of a soft light, a warm fire burning, maybe a light dusting of snow on the roof, a comfortable Christianity. A Christianity where marriages are always perfect. A Christianity where nobody has to ever worry about somebody getting hit by a drunk driver. You know, sort of a home on the range where the skies are not cloudy all day, never is heard a discouraging word. That sort of Christianity that when you start trying to find it, you realize it's only a mirage to begin with. Now, it is true that Christianity is meant to be a life full of joy and a life full of purpose and a life full of, fami- of uh, fulfillment, but it's also full of hardship and adversity and brokenheartedness. Experience confirms that for us, but it's not just experience that shows us that, it's what God's word teaches as well. Out of the presses of pain comes the soul's best wine. Welcome to Psalm 34. Psalm 34 is the fine wine of a soul that has been crushed in the painful press of life's afflictions. And in the heading of this psalm, the little subscript in all capital letters, we're given the details of this painful press. It reads, of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. This song is the byproduct of what is perhaps one of the most uh, frightening and dangerous points of David's young life. David has been anointed as the future king of Israel, which causes the current king, Saul, to fly into this jealous rage. He wants to kill David. David's forced to flee for his life. He has to leave his family. He has to desert his closest friend. He leaves with no food, no bodyguard, no weapons, no armor, nothing. He's completely out on his own. And when he comes to this place called Nob, he acquires food from a priest there. And then he asks that same priest if there's any weapons that might be on hand in this, in this area. And the priest says, oh yes, there's one. There's one that you might be familiar with. It's the sword of Goliath. You remember Goliath. Right, the Philistine champion that David had killed and beheaded with that sword some years earlier. And David says to the priest, oh, there is none like that. Give it to me. And so he takes the, the bread and he takes the sword and he makes his way to Gath, a Philistine city, which this shows how erratic David is in this moment. Not only is Gath a Philistine stronghold, Goliath was a Philistine, but Gath is Goliath's hometown, And here comes David now carrying this, what I have to assume is a well-known sword. And you can imagine the offense that would cause. And David has now found himself perhaps jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. He was safer probably back in Saul's palace than he is right now in Gath. And so what does David do? What's his strategy? He feigns insanity. He acts so crazy that the king says, do I have a shortage of madmen around here? Get him out. And they do. That's what they do. And when David's out of sight, I can imagine he composes himself. Maybe he wipes the spit out of his beard 
and he makes his way to the cave of Adullam, a place where maybe for the first time in a long time he's able to find rest and safety and peace. And perhaps it's there, maybe, in that very cave where he composes this psalm. This psalm that is like the fine wine of a soul crushed in the press of life's pain. This is a song for the afflicted. And the main theme of this song that David writes is that affliction is not something God's people get exemption from. Rather, affliction is something God's people are delivered through. Did you catch that? It's a world of difference. Not exemption from, but deliverance through. And David has experienced this personally with what's just happened to him, and now he wants to write this song to teach it to you. Can you imagine a song designed to teach and edify and equip, not just a light and fluffy repeat the chorus 700 times sort of song, but a song designed to build Christians up in the faith, to teach, almost like Paul says in Ephesians 5, where we are to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, to address one another. And this song's a great example of that. It calls you to something. In fact, it calls you to two things, and then it gives you the reasons why. And that's what I want to show you now. The first response that David calls you to is a passionate praise. A passionate praise. Look at the first three verses with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. David is filled with this praise. It's welling up inside him and you can, you can almost hear the passion just coming out of those words. But I want you to notice a few things about this passionate praise. Number one is that it's ongoing. It's an ongoing praise. See there in verse one, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. This praise is unrelenting. No matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, it echoes Paul's words in Philippians 4 where he says, rejoice in the Lord on Sundays? No, always. Rejoice in the Lord always. This praise is ongoing. But the praise is not just ongoing, it's also God-centered. It's a God-centered praise. Look at, look at verse 1 again. I will bless the Lord at all times. Verse two, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Verse three, oh, magnify the Lord. Let's just go a little further here, shall we? Verse four, I sought the Lord. Verse six, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Verse eight, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Verse nine, oh, fear the Lord. Verse 10, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And on and on it goes. 16 times in 22 verses, we get capital L-O-R-D, which again we know is not just a meaningless name or generic title that you can attach to anybody you like. This is God's covenantal name, Yahweh. I am. So what do you think? Is this song about David and his feelings? Well, that's there to be sure, but it's not the primary thing. This is a song about Yahweh and his relentless commitment to those who belong to him. It's God-centered praise. Okay, so it's ongoing. It's God-centered. And then notice also, it's contagious, this praise. Verse two, notice that again. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Passionate praise, praise to God is something that is attractive to a certain kind of people. Let the humble hear and be glad. More literally, or another reading of this would be, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. No doubt he has humble people in mind, but the reason why they are humble is precisely because they have been afflicted, beaten down by life. The abused, 
the wounded, the worn out, the oppressed. These are the kinds of people who will boast in the Lord. In contrast to the powerful and the self-sufficient and the self-righteous who are much more likely to boast in themselves than in God. And so David appear, appeals directly to, to the humble, to the afflicted in verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It's an invitation. He's urging them to join him in this passionate praise. Why? David's going to tell us. And he's going to tell us by doing a couple of things here in quick order. He's going to share some of his personal testimony. And then he's going to also share some great universal promises and truths about God interspersed with that. So look at verse 4. David says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Notice he doesn't say he delivered me from all my physical afflictions, from all my fears. Sometimes that can be far worse. The emotional turmoil that takes place in your mind when you uh, worry and anticipate and fear what may happen can sometimes be worse than the actual happening itself, right? What if it is cancer? What if they do foreclose? What if we lose our health insurance? What will happen to us? And what David says here, and remember this is David, a man after God's own heart, he says, you're not exempted from experiencing those kinds of things. What he says is better. God didn't exempt me from my fears. He delivered me through them. And the way he shows that is by this personal testimony that he delivers. And then he follows in verse five with a universal promise. He says, those who look to him, to God, are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. And then in verse 6, back to more personal testimony. This poor man himself cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles, which is followed again by another universal promise. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying, this has been my experience of God. And if you place your trust in God, this will prove to be your experience as well. And by the way, this is a powerful sort of one-two punch to remember when you're sharing your faith. What David's doing here, a little personal testimony followed by a little objective truth, subjective experience backed up by objective truth, testimony followed by theology. Remember that as you're sharing your faith with others. That's a powerful way to witness. And before we move on to verse 8, don't miss the little phrase there in verse 7, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh in verse 7. Who is this? He shows up every once in a while in the Old Testament. And if you ever study him, there's a few things that you'll discover about this angel of Yahweh. Number one, he does things that only God can do, and he makes promises that only God can make. Number two, he is sometimes referred to as God. But also, he is definitely seen as a distinct person from God. And very interestingly, once the Old Testament canon closes, we never again read of this angel of the Lord, this angel of Yahweh. So let me ask you now, as Christians, aware of the fullness of God's revelation in the New Testament, can you think of anybody who does, on, does things that only God can do and makes promises only God can make, who is referred to as God himself, but yet is a distinct person from God? It's obvious, isn't it? Jesus Christ, you say, and that's exactly the point. You see, the second person of the Trinity doesn't wait until the New Testament to show up on the pages of, the, of salvation history. The Son is very active in the Old Testament as well. He appears repeatedly as this angel of Yahweh, this angel of the Lord. It's a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. And here, his role in Psalm 34, he's the protective presence around God's people, delivering those who fear him. Is Jesus in the Old Testament? All over the place. 
And then, once again, David gets back on track here, and he says, you know, not only is this my personal experience with God being delivered out of, of afflictions, but this is something you can experience for yourself. Verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, I want you to notice here what this doesn't say. Okay, backing up to verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So, read John Calvin. Or so, listen to John MacArthur. Those are good things. But what David is calling us to here is not an analytical exercise as much as he calls you to experience God. And for some of us, including myself, that can make me a little nervous at times. But words like taste and see, those are words that invite you to come experience the goodness of God for yourself. Not that when you do, you'll be exempted from affliction, from trouble. In fact, what you'll find is probably the very opposite will be true. If you seek your ultimate satisfaction in God, you may find yourself wearing a bullseye for people who hate God. The point is, come what may, God and his goodness are more than sufficient for you, which is the exact same point he makes again in verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. They lack nothing. And then he says, you want an illustration of this? Look at verse 10. The young lions suffer want and hunger. Okay, if you've ever seen the movie, The Ghost in the Darkness, right about those two man-eating lions that uh, over a hundred railroad workers are devoured by, you get the picture that usually for a lion, food's not a problem. But what David's saying here is that sometimes even young lions at the top of their game, powerful, self-sufficient, a, a, a prowess in hunting, even those young lions sometimes go without. But, he continues in verse 10, those who seek the Lord lack nothing. Those who seek the Lord endure as long as God determines. Not, not because they're powerful or self-sufficient, but because God preserves them. He provides for them. He cares for them. He watches over them. Not so that they can experience lives of comfort, free of affliction, free from adversity, free from suffering. Not for that. Remember, David himself is not insulated from those kind of experiences. God's people never, ever are. Look how God's people are referred to just in this psalm. In verse 2, he refers to them as the humble or the afflicted. In verse 4, he calls attention to their fears. In verse 6, he refers to their troubles. Does this sound like exemption from those things? But what he also mentions is deliverance. See it there in verse 4? I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. See it again in verse 7? The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Just to recap here, what I want you to be seeing so far is that out of the presses of pain comes the soul's best wine and that God's people are not given exemption from affliction. Rather, they are granted deliverance through affliction. And your response is, to this great truth about God and his deliverance for you, David's saying, firstly, should be a passionate praise. But there's a second response. There's a second response to which David calls you, and that is a righteous life. Not just a passionate praise, but also a righteous life. Verse 11. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Sounds like Proverbs a bit there, doesn't it? Where the wise father counsels his son. But if you're paying attention, does that fit with this psalm? Remember now, David just told us, he just invited us to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. And now, just a couple of verses later, he says that we need to fear the Lord. Is that inconsistent? 
Isn't that a contradiction? Only if you have a wrong view of God. Because make no mistake, God is to be experienced and God is to be uh, enjoyed, but he is also to be feared. In fact, it's not the first time David used that language either. Look back at verse 7 again. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. In verse 9, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. Put simply, those who fear Yahweh are those who belong to Yahweh. And that word fear, it carries the idea of sort of a reverence for or a a dependence on, but most frequently when it's used, it simply means to obey God. To fear God is to obey him. It means to live righteously in response to him, to who he is, and to what he has done for you. David asked this rhetorical question there in verse 12. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? All of us, right? So what does it mean to, to fear God and to live righteously? David's got three things in mind here that he's going to show us, okay? Okay. In other words, the question he's asking is, what kind of person wants to experience God's blessings in their life? And the first thing is, it's the person who speaks with integrity. Verse 13, the person who speaks with integrity. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Have you ever thought about how much God hates deceitful speech? Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, Proverbs says. One of the groups kept out of the New Jerusalem in Revelation are liars. Secondly, though, it's not just the person who speaks with integrity. It's the person who lives faithfully. Verse 14, turn away from evil and do good. In other words, live a life that's consistent with the God you profess. Okay? That means you put off evil things and you put on godly things. It's a lifestyle of repentance, of ongoing repentance that should define your life. And thirdly, The person who wants to experience God's blessings should be a person who seeks harmony. Who seeks harmony. Verse, uh, the last part of verse 14 there. Seek peace and pursue it. And here it's not peace with God that's in mind so much as it is peace with people. And more specifically, it's peace with people within the covenant community of faith. People with quirks people with delicate egos, people with irritating habits, people with strong emotional reactions, and people who seemingly have no emotional reaction. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but take a second and just look around at each other. Go ahead. Take a good look. Maybe you have noticed this before. People in the church are weird. We are. People in the church are weird, and we, we all are. We all have our quirks. And here's the point, is that harmonious relationships will not happen by themselves if just left to chance. There are people in this room that you would not normally associate with in other walks of life. But as members of God's family, as members of God's body, the church, we are called to seek after and pursue those kinds of harmonious relationships with each other. So these are three examples of what David means when he says, live a righteous life. But why, again, why fear the Lord? Why should trying to live a righteous life be a priority for you? Because it's it's just like the first response that David calls you to, that response of passionate praise. Living a righteous life is a worshipful response to God and his deliverance out of affliction for you. Verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. He sees them. He hears them. But, and this is important, who are the them? It's the righteous. 
God is tuned into the righteous in a very different way than he is to those who are not righteous. In fact, he says in the very next verse, verse 16, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. In other words, God has taken a position of hostility against those who do evil, against the unrighteous. And so you can easily imagine you know, a 300-pound nose tackle on the line of scrimmage, just salivating for that ball to be snapped. He's bearing down on the opposing quarterback, and when, when it finally happens, he's like a freight train, just destroying everything in his path to get to that quarterback. To what end? The verse continues. This is like God to cut off the memory of them from the earth, to destroy them. But for the righteous, God's eyes and ears are always open. For the righteous, he's always looking. He's always listening. He's more ready to respond than we are to request. So, since God is tuned into the righteous people, then that must mean that they're exempted from afflictions, right? Well, look at verse 17. When the righteous cry for help, now what does that assume? The Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. What does that presuppose? And saves the crushed in spirit. Now I know just by looking around this room that right now there are some of you who are brokenhearted. Some of you who are crushed in spirit. Some of you who feel like you can't really go on. If that's you, you need to hear this. His eyes see you in your need. His ears hear your prayerful requests. He comes near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. And I can say that because like David, I've experienced that. I can say that because this is what God's word teaches. And in my stronger moments, I can even say that if what it takes for God uh, to draw near to me for me to experience God more fully and more powerfully, if, if what it takes for that to happen is affliction and heartache, then God, do what you will. But I'm also just like you, which means that most of the time when I say that prayer, I have my fingers crossed behind my back. Because all of my natural instincts want to do everything possible to avoid any sort of adversity or suffering but in my most Christian moments, I can tell you that it's worth it. The affliction is worth it. It's worth the opportunity to savor God's goodness, to experience, even if just for a moment, a taste of what we might one day know with him in eternity. God's goodness. And it's in that sense that I don't want exemption from affliction. I want deliverance through affliction and everything that's wrapped up in God as a result of that. Disappointments, disasters, medical concerns, financial concerns. Verse 19 says that many are the afflictions of the righteous. Not a few, not a little, not even sometimes, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But it should comfort you to know that God himself has set the limits on your affliction. And that's what David is getting at in the next line there. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. God sets the boundaries of what evil comes your way, including even the evil that others seek to inflict upon you. Verse 21 Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. But for those who belong to him, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. 
none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So are Christians exempt from affliction? Let me ask you another question. Do you know people, perhaps even professing Christians, who've given up on God because he didn't come through for them in a moment of need when they reached out to him? From their perspective, they needed God and they came up empty. And so they're angry. They feel ripped off. They feel deceived. Maybe you've felt that way yourself. Here's something I want you to take away and think about for people who are going through that or even if you're going through that. It appears God doesn't deliver only when we have trusted him for things that he has never promised. Let me say that again. It appears God doesn't deliver only when we trust him for things that he has never promised. People often say, I'm trusting God. What are you trusting him for? To do it your way? To do it when you want? On your timetable? That's not faith. Faith is a confident trust in what God has said and what God has promised. Faith is not trusting God for things that we have imposed on him. And then we have the audacity to get angry with God when he fails to come through on our impositions? Come on. The problem is we often trust him for things that he has never promised to deliver on. God has not promised you exemption from cancer or divorce or economic struggles or failure. He's not promised those kinds of things. He never promises to spare you a broken heart. But he does promise to heal that broken heart. He's not promised you exemption from, but deliverance through. Think about the story of the Bible, the big story of the Bible. Was Abraham exempted from? Was Noah exempted from? Was Moses exempted from? Was Elijah? Was Daniel? Was Jeremiah? Was John the Baptist exempted from? Was Peter exempted from? Was Paul exempted from? Do you find yourself in a season of affliction this morning? A time of suffering filled with fears of the unknown? Broken hearted? Crushed? then you need to know that God's eyes are upon you. That his ears are open to your prayers. Does this mean exemption from? No. It means deliverance through. But does this mean deliverance through when you want it? Let me see if I can help flesh this out a little more fully. Does verse 20 sound familiar to you? He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. It should. Those same words appear again in John's gospel. It's when Pontius Pilate orders the Roman soldiers to shatter the legs of three crucified men to quicken their death. And so the soldiers approach the man on the right with a giant mallet and they break his legs. And they approach the man on the left with that same big hammer, and they break his legs. But when they come to the man in the middle, Jesus, they find that he's already dead. And so there's no need to shatter his legs. You see, having endured the full cup of the wrath of God, he died unnaturally soon. But more to the point, his father had set the limitations on his afflictions. And which is why John writes then, these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Whenever I'm asked the difficult question of why does God make us endure affliction and suffering in this world, 
And it's a hard question. There's one thing that gives me comfort. What comforts me is the real realization that in Jesus Christ, God himself entered this fallen world and he took his own medicine and he drank it to the dregs. He has experienced in a far greater way any suffering that you or I might ever endure. So what am I saying here? He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. What I'm saying is that the sinless son of God is the ultimate afflicted man. Jesus Christ is the man of fears. Jesus Christ is the man of troubles. Jesus Christ is the man crying for help. Jesus Christ is the man crushed in spirit. Jesus Christ is the broken-hearted man of Psalm 34. Jesus Christ is the man who prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for exemption from. Remember? If it be your will, let this cup pass from me. And God said to his own son, no, not exemption from. Not if as a human you want to experience the full effect of sin in their place. God didn't give him exemption from, but he granted him deliverance through. Raising him from the dead on the third day without a single bone being broken, just like he had promised. For Jesus, it went affliction, death, deliverance. Psalm 34 was fulfilled in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And it's also the paradigm for you and your life. Not exemption from affliction, but deliverance through affliction, even if need be, to the point of death, trusting in the God who raises from the dead. You may experience deliverance in this life. You may. But ultimately, and climactically, it's beyond the grave that you can expect a full and complete deliverance from every effect of the fall. Out of the presses of pain comes the soul's best wine. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is what you can trust God for. This is his guarantee to you. And it's been secured by the man who was afflicted and then delivered. Who died and then rose again. Jesus Christ. And what should your response to this be? A passionate praise and a righteous life. Could it ever be anything less than those things? We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.